Um, today I'll be talking about the mechanics of multi-fault earthquakes, which result from the um, failure of complex fault networks. Because seismic moment increases uh, with the number of faults activated in an event, um, by definition, all large earthquakes are multi-fault earthquakes. So in my mind, there's really uh, no more important problem in facing earthquake scientists today than to understand the, the me mechanics of multi-fault earthquakes. Today, I'll be uh, showing you a really fascinating data set from the El Mayor Cucapá earthquake, which struck Northern Baja, California in 2010. Um, at first, the data set seemed impossible, and we really had to, um, to throw out almost everything we thought we knew about uh, the, the limits of lithospheric stress and the processes of faulting. Our new mechanical model for multi-fault earthquakes is called the Keystone Fault Hypothesis. And I'll show you that, um, I'll, I'll argue that Keystone, misoriented Keystone faults control the stability of complex fault networks. And that I'll show you that they're very easy to identify based on their orientation and position in the network. This work was published in Nature Geoscience in 2016, and it turns out that our hypothesis has important implications for how earthquakes are generated on severely misoriented faults like the San Andreas and the entire class of low angle normal faults. I'll start off by um, defining a few of the technical terms. Slip tendency is a parameter that measures uh, the degree of fault misorientation. As you know, faults of different orientations plot at different positions on a Mohr circle. Those that plot close to the line of critical failure, frictional failure, are optimally oriented and have a high slip tendency. Those that plot far from the failure envelope have, uh, are misoriented and have a low slip tendency. Oh, one other point, just notice that if differential stress is great enough for optimally oriented faults to be critical, severely misoriented faults like low angle normal faults are still very stable and plot tens of megapascals below the frictional failure line. This is a figure by John Spencer showing um, the evolution of detachment fault systems and I've color coded the fault sections according to their slip tendency. Although there's broad consensus on what these faults uh, look like and how they evolve, there's really no consensus at all and much controversy about how they behave mechanically. At the heart of the controversy, of course, in my mind is um, how to activate faults with a wide range of orientations and slip tendencies um, in, the, in a single evolutionary phase. Okay, complex fault systems ar arise because of the three-dimensional strain of most plate margin shear zones. Most plate margin shear zones have oblique shearing and combine either strike slip, combine strike slip with either extension or shortening. This three-dimensional strain gives rise to um, complex fault networks and in order to accommodate the three-dimensional strain, it's not sufficient to simply combine the end member conjugate sets from the 2D scenarios of Anderson. Instead, you need a network of fault with faults with diverse orientations and slip directions. Complex fault systems are characterized by faults that are generally of many different orientations. They're short, discontinuous, and end at intersections with other faults. In order for tectonic blocks to move in the directions dictated by regional strain, they must activate slip on more than one fault. This gives rise to um, intimate interactions between faults and makes it very unlikely that any individual fault in the network operates independently of the rest. Now, we'll keep these uh, conceptual models in mind as we go to look at the structural relationships of the El Mayor Kukapa earthquake, which occurred in the central portion of the Pacific North American plate margin, where transtensional shearing in the Gulf of California changes to transpressional shearing along with San Andreas. Both of these shear, oblique shear regimes produce strongly three-dimensional strain. And, um, <clears throat> and both are characterized by complex fault networks. The El Mayor Cucapa earthquake produced one of the most complex surface ruptures ever recorded on the Pacific North American plate margin. 
It started on a north striking normal fault and propagated bilaterally across the Colorado River Delta and through the Sierra Kukapa. Notice the change in polarity of tectonic transport from west directed in the Delta domain to east directed in the Sierra domain. The centroid moment tensor is strongly non-double couple and neither of these nodal planes correspond to any of the faults activated in the event. Rather, the centroid moment tensor gives a sort of blurry representation of all the faults that ruptured together in the event. Faults are best exposed in the Sierra Kukapa, and that's where we focus most of our structural studies. This is a map of the Sierra Kukapa, which is composed of Mesozoic crystalline basement and shows the complex fault network in all of its glory. The network is, is composed of faults that are short, discontinuous, and end at intersections with other faults, which are here highlighted on the map. In order to make it through the complex network, the earthquake had, had to activate sections of almost every single individual fault. The geometric diversity of the earthquake is extreme, and the dips of the faults varies from subvertical to moderately dipping to very gently dipping as low as 20 degrees. The strikes of the faults range in azimuth by 120 degrees. This great geometric diversity gives rise to great kinematic diversity. And in this photo, Tom Rockwell is standing in front of a scarp with almost uh, four meters of vertical offset. Um, the kinematics of, of the fault scarps range from pure strike slip to pure vertical uh, normal sense dip slip, but most of the scarps um, are oblique slip and they combine components of lateral offset and uh, normal sense dip slip. These components, the ratios of these components vary systematically with fault orientation, and they range continuously between the end members seen in the previous slides. All of this is spectacularly displayed by offset geomorphic markers. We used, um, we, we used a stress inversion we use the fault slip data to um, invert for stress. And the data are divided into two main data sets. The co-seismic surface rupture is, is shown by the blue arrows. And aftershock moment tensors compiled by Yang and Hoxson are shown by the beach ball symbols. Stress inversion uh, gives you the orientation and relative magnitude of the principal stresses. Relative magnitude is uh, defined by a parameter called phi, which ranges from zero to one. And you can see that our data are strongly skewed toward the extremes of one, which suggests that um, sigma two and sigma one are close in magnitude. These stereo plots um, show the, the best uh, stress models for both data sets, which again are divided into surface rupture and aftershocks. These are tangent line diagrams where the direction of azimuth of fault slip is, is plotted on top of the pole to the fault plane. You don't have to be intimately familiar with this plotting convention to appreciate that the direction, the observed direction of fault slip noted by the black arrows is very close to the orientation of the predicted or hypothetical fault slip. This tells you that the results of the stress inversion are very robust. Um, the, Stress axes in both data sets are remarkably coaxial, but we have a stress permutation whereby sigma one and sigma two swap positions. We use the stress permutation and geologic context of the surface rupture to calculate absolute stress at seismogenic depths. For the sake of time, I'm gonna skip the details, but just show you a representative, representative solution of absolute stress. This is a more diagram showing the coexisting permuted stress states that we document along the length of the rupture. The plotted symbols systems activated in the event. For the remainder of the talk, I'm just going to um, focus on characteristics of this data set that are true regardless of the assumptions used to calculate absolute stress. And one of those characteristics is the great geometric diversity of the slip systems activated. 
which um, requires them to experience great differences in the magnitude of the applied loads. The centroid moment tensor is plotted as this in the, in the middle of the cloud of the geologically determined uh, co-seismic surface uh, sub subsystems. You can see that the geologic data provide a much better um, view of the real uh, kinematic and, geolo and geometric diversity of the slip systems. And explaining this great diversity, it gets to the heart of the mechanics of multi-fault ruptures. So let's start testing hypotheses. It's possible to make faults of different orientations all slip together in the same event if friction is systematically lower or pore pressure is systematically higher in faults that are progressively more misoriented. These hypotheses have been used extensively by us in the earth science, in the rock mechanics community. But um, there's one problem with, the, with both of them, and that is that there's no reason, no logical reason why Property, um, properties that control the strength of a fault should vary systematically with fault orientation. Therefore, there's good reason to be skeptical. And I would say that our data required us to reject both of them. John, you're at 10 minutes now. Okay, thank you. Notice that um, the faults of the symbols of the same color come from the same fault. And so it's very unlikely that we could um, vary physical conditions or properties along different sections of the same fault, which all have the same, cut the same protolith and have similar magnitudes of um, finite slip. Any absolute stress model uh, needs to explain how the earthquake ruptured. And in this case, the normal fault that started the event is plotted as this white box. You can see that it is critically stressed at the very limit of its frictional strength. Okay, which is required or it never would have slipped in the first place. But also notice that there are many other nearby fault sections that are super critically stressed and have um, apparent friction well in excess of any reasonable limit of fault strength. So that gives rise to the main problem with explaining multi-fault ruptures, which is it requires mechanisms for both maintaining fault stability at high slip tendency and for destabilizing faults with low slip tendency. We have an idea for how to do this, but I first need to show you some more characteristics of the um, fault that initiated the earthquake. Waveform modeling of the first 15 seconds of the earthquake shows that it initiated on a gently dipping normal fault that occurs in the subsurface in this region here. Due to the gentle to moderate dips, this fault must project underneath the Sierra Kukapa and its 6.3 magnitude suggests that it extends 35 kilometers, which puts it almost at the northern end of the Sierra. So all the faults that um, we observe at the surface that ruptured in the event are underpinned by a, a moderately dipping normal fault. So this is a schematic cross section showing the cross cutting relationships and the paths and the arrows show the paths that rupture took after starting on the moderately dipping normal fault. Notice the interlocking geometry of the fault network whereby optimally oriented faults are pinned against misoriented faults. This figure shows um, the first stage of the inner seismic stress buildup, which occurs decades, centuries, and possibly in some cases even millennia before the main event. The first stage starts when the most optimally oriented fault reaches criticality and begins to slip. However, we hypothesize that it can't produce a large earthquake because it is pinned against a misoriented fault that is well below critical. Regional stress continues to build up and the optimally oriented fault bleeds off excess shear stress that it can't support in um, micro slip events and creep. Any fault that controls and regulates uh, slip uh, on a more optimally oriented fault is called a keystone fault. Okay, other less optimally oriented faults reach criticality and they undergo the same process as regional stress increases. Finally, the, the keystone fault 
that is stabilizing the entire network reaches critical stress. And when it fails, there's nothing holding it back and it fails together with other faults in the network. Why? Because they had been maintained at critical stress throughout the late stages of the inner seismic cycle. So this, my friends, is the Keystone Fault Hypothesis. The Keystone Fault Hypothesis changes everything we thought we knew about the limits of lithospheric stress. And you can find, and for decades, we've been using the Brace and Colstead idea that optimally oriented faults are ubiquitous and they control the strength of the lithosphere. We, we teach our students that the differential stress is like a balloon. More circles are like a balloon. When they touch the fail razor sharp failure envelope, they pop, create an earthquake and go back to a more relaxed state. But this um, idea really only applies to the most optimally oriented faults. And it's um, analogous to saying that the weakest links in the chain control the strength of the chain. The problem here is that the seismogenic zone isn't a chain. It's a continuous medium. And in order to break a continuous medium, you have to break the strongest part, not the weakest. So in the context of complex fault systems, if only one fault orientation is critical, the rest of the network is entirely stable. And the Keystone Fault Hypothesis predicts the differential stress will rise, rise into the danger zone until a keystone fault becomes critical. This has never been um, widely accepted because everyone knows that there are other faults in the system that can't support so much uh, shear stress. So we provide a mechanism whereby they bleed it off and um, maintain themselves within the failure envelope throughout the late stages of the inner seismic cycle. When the Keystone Fault fails, all the rest of them fail in a very large earthquake. So um, low angle normal fault systems are beautiful examples. Low angle normal faults themselves are Keystone Faults. And we propose that they regulate slip on other more optimally oriented faults in their hanging wall, and they should fail together in, in a single earthquake. This explains why they're so rare to see in centroid moment tensors of global seismicity. The reason why you don't see low angle normal faults is the same reason why you don't see high angle normal faults in these events. It's because they fail together and the centroid moment tensor is just a blurry representation of all the faults activated and it gives nodal planes that on average are 45 degrees. Baja California has some of the best examples of uh, seismically active low angle normal faults. These are earthquake ruptures in the Cañada de V detachment. To my knowledge, we're the first ones to do paleo seismology on them. And I can summarize our results of the paleo seismology with one word, and that is boring. They're extremely well behaved with regular recurrence intervals that are exactly what you would predict for faults that have this slip rate. So um, with that, I'll just say thank you and uh, open it up for questions. Thanks a lot this early morning talk. Uh, we have one or maybe two uh, questions, um, time for questions, but you have to be quick in posing them, otherwise time will run out. And while you type one, I would have one, unless other people have one. How, how common do you think these multi-fault earthquakes actually are? Do you think every um, earthquake is like this or is it only some of them? All large magnitude earthquakes are by definition multi-fault earthquakes. I mean, just think of the large events in the past 10 years uh, or more or earlier. Uh, the the Kaikor earthquake activated more than 20 different faults. Ridgecrest activated many faults. Um, and we've gone through and, and are starting to look at the seismic catalogs and Loma Prieta is a very interesting case. The San Andreas is a beautiful example of a misoriented keystone fault and it was the first one to rupture in that event and it took with it a lot of optimally oriented thrust faults and it's side. so yeah it, every single large any earthquake above magnitude six is a multi-fault earthquake very common intriguing um i have to cut it off here but if everybody if anybody has a question uh, you're welcome to put them in the chat and um 
maybe John can answer them right away, but we have to move on to the next speaker, otherwise we're running out of time. 